Welcome to the last part of the ConvNet chapter. So this is part of the crash course on deep learning. And today we're going to cover modern convolutional networks. So that's ResNet, SCNet, so squeeze excitenet, one by one convolutions and related things, ShuffleNet and so on. And basically all those innovations allowed one to go beyond the designs of Lynette and AlexNet in terms of computational efficiency, also in terms of accuracy, but it's mostly it allowed one to go deeper within a given computational budget. Okay, let's start with something fairly seminal, but simple. So if we look at VGG, Right, so that's the visual geometry group in Oxford, and after them, that's what this network is named. It's basically an even deeper version of, you know, AlexNet and Lynette. And so the big difference was that they had to go to fairly expensive, sort of almost dense operations. So you can see, you know, 512 channels and so on. But overall, what they did is they showed that smaller numbers of convolutions, well, smaller convolutions, but a larger number of them really made a big difference. So if you compare AlexNet on the left and VGG on the right, you can see that more narrow convolutions are better than fewer wide ones. The other thing that we started seeing, because this is just a really complicated beast, is that it helps if you can write these network architectures as code. So you have repetitive elements, and so just like you wouldn't write print one, print two, print four, print five, but rather than that, for e equals i equals one to five, print i, you start seeing code-like designs where you know, you no longer design individual neurons or no longer design individual layers, but you design functional units and then you repeat them. Okay. So the VGG block is basically a couple of, you know, three by three convolutions, and then in the end, you know, a max pooling layer. And now the architecture is, as said, well, you have those blocks. Now that also meant that suddenly you started seeing not just a single network design, but an entire parametric family like VGG16, VGG19, and so on. And they differ mostly by how many blocks they have and how rapidly they downgrade and so on, and you know how many channels they have in the end. So basically this allowed designers to trade off between computational complexity on one end and accuracy on the other. So if we were to summarize this, right? So Lynette is, you know, two convolutions and two poolings. Then AlexNet, everything's just bigger up to the limit of what two GPUs supported. And then VGG was again, bigger and deeper than AlexNet, but mostly also by virtue of repeated blocks. And that, yeah, that gives you a significant accuracy boost. So if you look at this, you know, speed versus accuracy plot here, and you want to be on the upper right. So if you were to plot a Pareto curve, right, you want to get go either to the right or to the top. To the top means higher accuracy at a given speed. To the right means higher speed at a given level of accuracy. And this is, you know, from the Luan model zoo. And you can see that VGG gives you significant improvement. Multiple dots simply because they're multiple different models. The size has to do with the number of parameters required. And you can see that VGG is fairly heavy. And we'll look at more lightweight models later on. But for now, suffice it to say this worked better. Now about that big size. So the last layer is a really big problem. So for instance, for Lynette already, right, this is where you have those fully connected neurons. 
And so in Lynette, well, this wasn't a big deal. This was less than 50 kilobytes. Well, for AlexNet, it's 26 megabytes. And for VGG, it's, you know, 0 0.1 gigabyte. So, well, why does this matter? Because you need, you know, number of classes, right? In times height times width times number of channels, right? So this is, this is problematic. And so if width and height are anything non-trivial, then, well, you pretty much screwed in terms of memory, right? Also computation. So for instance, for VGG, this is really the compute budget. And you can see those two lines, which tell you where most of your compute goes. Now, there are a couple of ways how to break the curse of the last layer. And the idea is actually very surprisingly simple, simple to the extent where you wouldn't think that it would work. You simply get rid of the fully connected last layers, right? And so what you do is you, you know, perform convolutions and you pool in the end, you perform like a global average pooling to reduce just everything to, you know, a one by one object and you call it a day. Now, this is good, but you need a couple of other things to get now more information, you know, within each of the channels. And so what you do is you basically have those one by one convolutions. Those one by one convolutions can be viewed as we already discussed before as a deep network just inside things. So that's why in that paper that proposed this it was actually called network in network. But it's really just a one by one convolution. But of course, if you call it network in network, you can write the paper. If you call it a one by one convolution, people will go like, what does that even do? Okay, so you get it published. Anyway, um, this is by now standard. Um, if we compare things, right, so VGGNet and NinNet. So NinNet was actually very similar to VGG in the sense that, you know, you have those convolutions blocks, except that it added, uh, you know, one by one convolutions into it. And also at the very end, rather than having those dense layers, it performed global average pooling. Global average pooling is a complicated mouthful for let's just average over all the pixels within a channel. Okay. So there we go. And this drastically reduces complexity. Right. So initially, you know, you have all those convolutions and so on. And then in the end, well, we are left with, you know, five by five. And so this is for MNIST, mind you. And then we reduce it to, you know, 10 channels because we have 10 classes from 384 to 10. Still five by five. Then we pull to one by one and that's it. So you can clearly see how by using a better network design that avoids this dense network, you're still going to do fairly well. Now you might answer, ask, you know, why on earth does this global average pooling actually work? Well, let's say I have a cat and this cat can be somewhere in the image, right? Then it's clear that I want to have a certain amount of translation variance. This global average pooling does that for me. Now, might people have tried also rather than just average pooling, maybe max pooling or maybe some variant of that? Well, probably yes, maybe there's a little bit more to be gained. If nobody's written that paper, maybe you should try this. Anyway, this is a very simple idea. Another really simple idea, and that led to a big breakthrough, is residual networks. We mentioned that or a little bit before when we talked about multi-layer perceptrons in general, but this was actually proposed in the context of ConvNets. Mind you, the motivation and what it actually does may be a little bit different, but regardless, here's what we have. Let's say we have some residual networks and so I have some generic function class, and then I have, you know, a nested function class. And what I might actually want is I might want to have a nested function last class rather than a generic one, because in a generic one, as I keep on making it more complex, so this is basically making it larger, then, 
well that generic function class changes as well. So I'm not so it's not necessarily clear that the bigger function class is actually more powerful and can explain everything that I could have explained before, but it now explains different things. That makes it really hard to control. Whereas if it's nested, then by just adding more complexity, things will always get better. Okay. So what does this all have to do with our deep networks? Well, if I add another layer to my neural network, my network changes. And it's not even clear that I could still easily model the things that my network was able to do before, but it now models different things. And that's not always a good thing because you want to parameterize complexity in a natural manner. And so here et al. proposed residual networks to address this. The idea is very simple, namely, you just add the input to the output. I mean, of course, this only works if the dimensionality is the same, but you basically have, you know, just, you know, weight layer, activation function, another component layer, and then you add things to it. And then, of course, you throw it through an activation. So this is almost like a Taylor expansion where you parameterize no longer around f of x equals zero, which would be the whole weights being zero, but around f of x equals x. Because now, if all the weights are zero, then x is just transmitted unchanged. That also makes it easier for the gradients to propagate through and for everything to converge. So this has a lot of nice side effects. Of course, you can modify this a little bit, like you can add a one by one convolution to it. So it's not just adding things, but you could, for instance, change the number of channels and do a lot of other tricks. Regardless, this is essentially what allows you to get a much better inductive bias in terms of function class. And those residual connections are by now in use, not just in computer vision, but also for recurrent neural networks and transformers and other things. That's a really useful trick. Um, so the ResNet module thus is basically, you know, those convolutions uh, with the residual addition, and then you repeat this a couple of times, you run it through a ReLU, and that's about it. So the code that goes with that is basically, you know, you just keep on adding blocks. So note that now we are designing again entire blocks of deep networks as opposed to just you know single neurons or single layers. Now, if you put this all together, you end up with something that's fairly complex. And mind you, it doesn't actually fit entirely on that slide because the last two ResNet blocks would be repeated three times. Then you go and train that scale. A couple of other things like batch normalization and so on are in there. They were proposed in the context of Google Net, but yeah, that works. Um, there is a lot more that's happened over the past four to five years. For instance, ResNext. And one of the ideas is how can we essentially squeeze out even more nonlinearity out of a given number of observations and parameters and channel, oh, basically out of a given amount of compute and parameters. So if you look at you know ResNest, uh, ResNet, then you have you know there's one by one, three by three, one by one convolutions, and they operate on. 64 and 256 channels respectively, right? Now, <clears throat> what you can do instead is you can say, well, um, let's split those channels up into groups of four. So I have 32 paths in total and you treat each of those individually like a tiny network. So you basically don't mix between all the features within a channel, but only within groups of four. Now this significantly reduces the amount of computation and you can invest that by going deeper still. So for the same cost, you can do more. Another really cute idea is the squeeze excitement idea of Hu et al. And the 
key idea there is that those convolutions are only local operations. So that means that if I wanted to transfer any information globally from one part of the image to another, I might have to wait for a very long time until all those convolutions carry the idea through. Now, that's not always a great idea. And so what they do is instead they use average pooling into a one by one channel, and then they use essentially an attention activation and more on that later, but basically they use a channel wise weighting in order to decide which channel matters for which image. So for instance, I mean, you could imagine this as, you know, if it's a black and white image, then maybe the color channels aren't super useful. Whereas, you know, if it's, you know, a static image of, you know, something engineered, then maybe round objects aren't so useful and so on. So you could, you can see how, depending on the context, now different channels are, have different importance and SE nets allow you to do this. The next thing going beyond ResNext is ShuffleNet. So remember ResNext breaks the channels into groups. Now, what you can do though is, and you know, you can mix between those channels, uh, but this is still computationally costly. Now, instead of that, what you can do is you can just shuffle the channels. And so basically you just perform grouping, then you perform, you know, your local per, you know, channel operations, and then you reshuffle again. Now the result of that is that you can get a lot of information transfer between channels without having to do any proper operations. The other tricks like shift net and so on, which basically just take the entire image and shift it by one pixel to the top or to the right. And all of those tricks are essentially ideas of how to milk extra nonlinearity out of a network in a way that doesn't cost any computational performance. So to give you a bit of an idea in terms of, you know, what this means computationally, for instance, for separable convolutions, usually you have, you know, height times width for the kernel, like let's say three by three. And then if I have, you know, 256 input and 256 output channels, right? So that's quite a bit. Then I have, you know, two to the 16 operations times nine, right? That's an expensive thing. So it's 64,000 times nine. On the other hand, if I go and break up the channels, so, you know, in the extreme case, if I do it all separately, then I no longer have, you know, two to the 16, but only two to the eight operations. That's a lot cheaper. Now, what this simply means is that if I trade off, you know, size of the channels, then I can drive down this input channel times output channel operation. So in summary, what we do is we use a number of computational tricks to adjust number of channels, number of operations per channel, number of nonlinearities that I can easily accomplish so that gets us back a little bit towards the feature engineering type of computer vision that it used to be a long time ago with, you know, the sift and surf features. But at the same time, this also means that we are now incorporating prior knowledge about, you know, which things are related and using that to our advantage. Well, I guess that's what happens when the field matures. Okay. Of course, there's a lot more material and background reading. So if you look at the book chapters, there's VGG and then Google Net. So we entirely skipped that sort of inception and ResNet and of course, batch norms. All of those ideas are key in making convolutional neural networks work in practice.